Today, we're going to try and cheat. Sort of. What we're actually going to do today is red non-metallic metal, or NMM as you've heard before. This isn't going to be a comprehensive NMM guide. I've already done that before and you can check it out linked in the description or in the top right hand corner of this video. What we're going to do is paint some shiny red non-metallic metal from an image. When you think about all that goes into replicating metal with non-metallic paint, like how the highlighting depends on the shape of what you're painting, the position of the viewer, the character of the light, the surroundings, the condition of the metal, it can quickly become very overwhelming. Let's forget everything we know about miniature painting for a minute and just cheat. Today we're going to prep a test model, snap a photo, and try to replicate the photo one for one on another mini. Sounds easy, but I'm sure it won't be. I don't fully know what I'm going to discover during this process. It's kind of one of those, this sounds fun, let's see what happens. So let's do just that and start by prepping the mini. The subject of my experimentation today will be this fancy new vampire, which I purchased two of. One will be the subject of my photography and the other will be what I paint. Also, after this experiment, the photography one will be consumed by my bits box because it's always hungry for more vampire parts. I'd like the photo version to be as shiny as humanly possible so we can really see the effect. For that, I'm going to use ink from this Molotow marker. I prefer this product because much like real metal, you can't see the grains of paint in this marker ink, whereas you can when using something like Citadel paint, a more common miniature painting product. The less we can see the individual pigments, the smoother and shinier and more metal-like it'll appear. After a quick and kind of messy decanting process, I applied the chrome directly to the model with my airbrush, making sure to cover all the armor in a nice, even coat. I've read that you can thin this with isopropyl, but to me it smelled so similar to my Tamiya paints that I took a risk and used Tamiya's thinner, X20A. Admittedly, it wasn't much of a risk because X20A is an alcohol-based thinner, but this hobby is a little low on the risk quotient, so you gotta milk it when you can. Oh, Jesus Christ! Fun fact, when you apply acrylic paint on top of this chrome, this happens. Probably annoying for the majority of cases, but I can think of one or two times when it'd be kinda handy. After the chrome was applied, I moved on to making it red. I applied a product from Tamiya called Clear Red. This stuff is normally pretty thick, so I thinned it with some more X20A. If you want to check out any of these products for yourself, they'll be linked in the description below, along with other hobby equipment I use frequently. It might take a few coats to get the level of red we're shooting for, but with a little patience, we get a very beautiful, shiny red armor. The last thing we need to do is paint various large details in black. Neighboring parts on the model itself will reflect light into parts we care to replicate if they remain shiny especially, so let's reduce that effect as much as possible. With that last detail taken care of, now we can move on to taking some photos. In getting a photorealistic result, there's more to snapping a picture than just using your cell phone at your hobby desk. We want to recreate the environment the model might be in to give us a realistic result for our picture. Earlier I mentioned how the environment our subject is in plays a role in determining details about lights and shadows. Let's make sure we take some time and think about that. For the ground, I'm going to use a guild ball mat I have that has a dark and evil feeling. All this nice texture should make for some interesting reflections. The background is unimportant as far as determining lights and shadows, but for the sake of having a clean photo, we'll use black. For our light source, we'll use a big, bright light through some diffusion to mimic a cloudy day. Finally, the last thing to consider is where our viewer will be, which in this case is a camera. We'll shoot our photo directly in front of the model at the same height as his eyes. This angle means we also need to consider what is behind the camera or in front of the miniature because that will also reflect light onto our subject. When you stare off into the horizon, the sky and earth seem to meet somewhere in the middle. Because of that, I'll simply lift the ground mat up to below the lens of my camera and I'll tilt my light down toward the camera like the two are meeting right where the viewer is. If you think I'm just being a weird camera freak when doing this, take a look at this example. When I lift the green sheet, the model changes completely. With the setup complete, I can take a few photos, rotating the model each time. While I had this set up, I also took the opportunity to snap a few other photos with different ground colors like snowy white, a verdant green field, or something less dramatic like a muddy battleground. 
I also messed with my white balance to simulate different light sources like moonlight or golden hour. If you want to check out any of these photos, I'll have them all linked in the description below in an album. Before we start replicating these photos in real life, this portion of today's video is sponsored. Broken Anvil Miniatures is an up-and-coming miniature brand featuring highly characterful designs such as orcs, kobolds, skeletons, and more, beautifully casted in resin. They also have STL files available for you 3D printing aficionados. As part of their Patreon campaign, Broken Anvil Monthly, you can get access to a new theme of miniatures every month to download and print for gaming and painting enjoyment. There are even still a few early bird spots left if you're looking to save. During May and June, we're seeing the Graveyard Shift theme full of vampire hunters, ghouls, goblins, bats, and rippers, their version of vampires. Did someone say vampires? They even produced a version of Dracula himself. All of the STLs come pre-supported by 3D Printing Pro, a fixture in the 3D printing scene. There's also a Discord available as part of the Patreon so you can talk, shop, or solve printing problems if they arise. If you want to test out Broken Anvil's 3D designs, they have a free STL available on their site. All of the goodies will be linked in the description of this video if you want to check them out. Thank you to Broken Anvil Miniatures for sponsoring this portion of today's episode. Now back to my shiny vamps. With our photos collected, I wanted to do a little Photoshop work to make my job easier. In Photoshop, you can reduce the complexity of the image by reducing the overall colors in the picture, and I reduced mine to about nine, which seemed to be the sweet spot. With these discrete layers, I could now more easily see exactly what colors are used to compose this end result. With my palette digitally determined, it was now time to map these colors to paints I actually had. With the mixture for the mid-tone approximated, I airbrushed it on, figuring that it made sense to start with whatever color was most represented on the mini. Despite my wet paint looking pretty correct, my dry paint looked totally wrong. I applied several layers of this to ensure I wasn't fighting against opacity. After messing around with the mixture trying to nail it, I figured that the airbrush was my enemy and instead just applied the paint with my paintbrush, which seemed to shift the hue a lot less. With the tones figured out for my experiment, I began to roughly map them out on the miniature, starting with a pretty small part so I could figure out how closely I could get to the photo before investing time in larger parts. There was a lot of putting paint down, checking in the reference photo, and then adjusting it slightly. There were no steps that made a huge difference, and instead it was very slow, methodical progress. One detail about the photos that was new to me were the intensely bright lines that occurred immediately below recesses in select areas. This is not a behavior that I've ever tried to do while attempting non-metallic metal, and I'm looking forward to trying it out next time. Earlier, I said that I was going to forget everything I knew about miniature painting, and one thing I had to quickly let go of was the color pink. Pink is a dangerous color to include in red because like gray with black, it has a strong chance of taking over, causing whatever you're trying to paint to look nothing like red. In certain areas of my photo, there were tons of pink, so I just kind of rolled with it. It even looked like the highlights might have been tinged a little orange, so not entirely pink, but something closer to peach. What's important to remember is that while one part of armor might have a higher amount of peach in it, different parts of armor will likely have more red. When you view two, three, or four parts together, your overall impression of what color the armor is supposed to be will change. I worked my way through the rest of the miniature painting in the same way, putting the color down in approximate locations, doing some fussy blending, and then moving on. At a certain point, my red didn't really feel red to my eye. My paint shop didn't really look like my photo. I felt a little lost. I didn't really know where it all went wrong. I broke out some red ink and matte medium to glaze in some lush red tones, but my ink was a little too glossy despite the addition of the matte medium. I then remembered that contrast paint exists and after some thinning with water, I applied that in select areas to adjust the hue. Contrast paint tends to be more matte than ink while also still being translucent and saturated like ink is. I was trying to not run over my highlights but instead glaze the midtone and shadow area. This wasn't really working fast enough so I decided to risk it for the biscuit and apply a very thin red contrast paint to the entire model via the airbrush. It's so thin that you might not even be able to tell that it's really doing anything. At this point, it wasn't really perfect and I was okay concluding my experiment and collecting my thoughts. In a vacuum, the paint job looks fine. When the two are put side to side in a video, that's when the world falls apart. 
I think despite the fact that I color match the hues in the picture, the overall impression of my red is it's far too scarlet and muddy. The Team M example is so much more luscious than what I did. Perhaps more fiddling with the airbrush and contrast paint could bring it back to life. Something worth mentioning is that very rarely is photorealism the singular end goal of miniature painting, although it may seem like it often is. While reality does help guide a lot of the decisions we make about painting, sometimes reality is a little boring. Looking at the forearm and shin on my reference model shows an example of this. Never would I keep such a large area, one single flat color on a model. I'd put texture in there, small bounce lights, all sorts of things. At the end of the day, this is an art form, and that allows us to make choices with our minis that improve the model to us as individuals, which is what makes art awesome. Everyone has a different opinion of what is good, so we get to see variety. Despite that, this was a really awesome and interesting experiment. It taught me more about NMM, the color red, and about trying to get a photorealistic result. This probably won't be the last time I try to attempt something like this. Hopefully you managed to learn something too. That's gonna do it for this video, guys. If you like the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you like the channel and you wanna support it, there are a number of ways that you can do that, namely a Patreon campaign in the description of this video where you can get access to a Discord server where we talk about all kinds of fun things like shiny red vampires and chromatic aberration. Probably not that. You also get access to my live stream VODs and also longer versions of my YouTube videos so you can see additional brushstrokes. You can also buy a vampire that I produced called The Duchess and digital course along with her to learn how to paint the model stroke for stroke. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to paint